Good evening. My name is Alan Swain, and I'm actually the congressional candidate, Republican nominee from Congressional District 2 for U.S. House of Representatives. Uh, we're privileged to have this evening several uh, Wake County uh, judicial uh, judges uh, that are seeking nomination or not nomination, but uh, office come November of this year for re-election. So uh, I'm very, we're very fortunate to have these talented people here, and I'd like to do a little intro. Um, we try to do these series of, of, of important events and town halls to get the word out so all of you can get to know uh, our ju just judges and our justices so we can make a, a difference and, and get the word out why we all have conservative values. Um, we have three panelists um, that we're going to have tonight. Uh, first panelist is uh, uh, Judge Justice Paul Newby. Uh, he's a candidate for the North Carolina Supreme Court Chief Justice, seat number one. Uh, Justice Paul Newby was born in Asheboro, North Carolina. He holds his undergraduate degree from Duke University and his law degree from UNC Chapel Hill. He and his wife attend Christ Baptist Church in Raleigh, where he is an elder and Sunday school teacher. Since beginning his service on the Supreme Court in 2004, Justice Newby has actively participated in various roles, seeking to enhance our justice system. As the only Republican on the court, uh, Justice Newby finds himself writing many dissenting opinions without much help from his liberal colleagues. Our second candidate is actually uh, Katie Griffin. She's the wife of uh, uh, Jefferson Griffin, who's a candidate for North Carolina Court of Appeals, uh, seat number 113. Uh, uh, Judge uh, Jefferson Griffin was born and raised on a farm in Red Oak, North Carolina, in, in Nash County. He graduated from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill in 2003. After graduating from UNC, Judge Griffin earned his U.S. Coast Guard captain's license and worked as a charter fisherman on the North Carolina coast. Judge Griffin graduated from North Carolina Central School of Law. He began practicing law in Kinston, North Carolina, focusing in civil litigation and criminal defense litigation. In, in 2010, uh, Judge Griffin joined the Wake County District Attorney's Office where he prosecuted cases from infractions to first degree murder over a five year period in 2015. Jefferson was appointed by Governor McCrory to be a district court judge in Wake County. He handled civil and criminal cases from all over Wake County in his current role. Judge Griffin was elected to a four-year term in 2016 general election of Wake County. Jefferson and his wife, Katie uh, Griffin, are members at Holy Trinity Anglican Church in, in Raleigh. Our third panelist uh, is a candidate for North Carolina Court of Appeals, seat number six. Uh, judge Chris Dillon was born and raised in Raleigh, North Carolina. He received his master's and undergraduate and law degrees from UNC Chapel Hill and received his master's of law from Duke University. He practiced law in Raleigh, focusing on administrative business and real estate law. Chris was elected uh, to an eight-year term on the North Carolina Court of Appeals in 2012 and has since participated in over 2,000 appellate decisions, having personally authored more than 700 opinions. Uh, Judge Dillon is an adjunct professor teaching real estate focused courses, focusing courses at both UNC Law and Campbell School of Law. He is married to Ann Finley, a special education teacher in Raleigh, and they have five children together. Uh, I'd like to welcome all three of the panelists. Um, in these trying times and everything that's going on with cases going on here within the state of North Carolina, but even more, uh, some of the uh, cases that are pending at, uh, that have occurred and we've heard results in uh, findings uh, with regard to the U.S. Supreme Court. There's a lot going on in in in, in the in our justice system that uh, this is a very pertinent time for us to have these esteemed panelists with us. So what I'd like to do is open the floor up now to to, to Justice Paul Newby, and Paul, the floor is yours. Uh, well, good evening, Alan. Thank you so much for hosting this. Uh, it certainly is a treat to be with you. These are statewide offices. Um, uh, certainly anybody in North Carolina, everybody in North Carolina has an opportunity to uh, vote for these positions. Uh, as uh, you said, I was uh, born in Ashboro, grew up in Jamestown. Mom was a school teacher, Alan, uh, dad, an hourly worker. I uh, first learned about the, the legal profession through my citizenship merit badge with uh, Boy Scouts on my way to Eagle. Um, you know, I, I have been blessed to have practiced law now for 40 years, despite my youthful appearance. 
Um, I've been on the court now 16 years. I was first elected in 2004, re-elected in 2012. Widespread bipartisan support both times. Um, you know, just very fortunate to have gotten to serve 16 years on the court. And as the senior member of the court, the uh, longest serving member of the court, uh, it's now uh, my opportunity to seek the chief justice position, which is the head of the judicial branch. Uh, people ask me, well, you know, how is the chief justice different than a senior associate justice? Well, the chief justice kind of sets the tone. Uh, just like the governor with the executive branch, the chief justice is the head of the uh, judicial branch, 6,500 employees, uh, clerks of court um, uh, throughout the state. Uh, certainly, uh, the chief justice helps coordinate uh, things with the district attorneys, with public defenders, with registers of deeds. Um, uh, you know, our judicial system is bedrock. Uh, I have lots of opportunities to speak, speak with judges from all over the world. And you might say, well, why do they come to North Carolina? Why do they come to the United States? Well, we are known for the rule of law. What's the rule of law? Everybody's treated the same. Um, Lady Justice is blindfolded. She can't see who comes before her. Rich, poor, powerful, not powerful. Everybody treated the same. Uh, certainly, that's been my approach since 2004. And as Chief Justice, I would emphasize that. And also, I think we need to think about justice delayed as justice denied. Uh, think about ways that uh, folks can have their disputes uh, uh, through the court system in a timely manner. Um, in terms of judicial philosophy, uh, I, since 2004, uh, I am consistently a conservative. Well, Paul, what do you, what do you mean you're a conservative? Well, Conservatives are folks who understand separation of powers, that there are three branches of government for a reason. And conservatives allow the legislative branch to make the laws, not judges, okay? Uh, judges shouldn't be making law. That's not why we were elected. We were elected to enforce the law as intended, whether it be the constitution or whether it be a statute. Um, and so we're conservatives, we're constitutionalists. What does that mean? Uh, well, constitutionalists are those who want to enforce the Constitution as written. And we've got common sense. Well, what, what do you mean common sense? Well, uh, we, we're part of a common law system. Uh, the law's for everybody. It's not for a bunch of elitist judges and lawyers. And so it's up to judges to be sure that the law is consistently uh, and clearly stated. So when folks go to their lawyer and they say, hey, uh, here's my situation, what should I do? a lawyer can tell them with a, some degree of confidence, this is what the law is, this is what you need to do. So uh, those are some of the reasons that I'm uh, running. I wanna uh, uh, point out that behind me, you see uh, there are actually five uh, candidates, three for the Supreme Court and uh, five for the Court of Appeals. Judge Dillon is the uh, sole incumbent uh, Republican who's running, conservative who's running for uh, the Court of Appeals. Uh, the other uh, folks are judges as well, and I'll let um, Katie and Judge Dillon talk about them. With regard to the Supreme Court, three seats are up, and again, these are statewide. Uh, I'm running for Chief Justice. Uh, Phil Berger Jr. is running for uh, an open seat, uh, and uh, Tamara Berenger is running against um, one of Governor Cooper's appointees. So, uh, Tamara uh, is, should be well known to folks in Wake County, former state senator, Phil Berger Jr. Uh, is currently serving on the Court of Appeals. Uh, we have a very experienced team, both judicially, and also I'd like to point out, you know, currently I'm the only justice on the Supreme Court uh, to have uh, been a former prosecutor, and uh, uh, Phil Berger uh, would bring that to the court as well. I'm also the only member of the court to have actually closed to a real estate transaction. I had a transactional practice. I've done civil and criminal, broad spectrum. Uh, and um, uh, also people say, well, how do you balance, you know, the political part being elected with being a judge? And, uh, you know, this is it. This is my last uh, uh, opportunity. If I uh, am successful here, I will serve uh, my one term as chief justice. So uh, certainly I will be guided fully by the principles of the law 
uh, not with regard to uh, other considerations. Uh, interestingly, as, as you mentioned at the beginning uh, to me, 55% uh, or more of North Carolinians want conservative judges. Well, what does that mean? They sim that simply means they don't want judges out there changing the law, legislating from the bench. So again, thank you for allowing us to be with you and uh, thank you for allowing me these open comments. Thank you very much, Justice Newby. Uh, our next panelist uh, to introduce herself uh, on behalf of her husband, uh, Jefferson Griffin, who's deployed with the National Guard is, is Katie Griffin, a lawyer Thank herself. You. <laughs> Thank you, Alan. And though I am a lawyer, I am no match for Justice Newby. So it's gonna be hard to follow that <laughs> speech, but I'm so glad um, to be here with y'all tonight. Thank you for having me on behalf of my husband, Jefferson who, as you said, is deployed right now with the National Guard. And uh, trust me, no one wishes he were here more than I do, but I'm going to give it my best shot. And I hope y'all will uh, give me some grace um, for the many times I'm sure I will stumble. Jefferson is running for the Court of Appeals uh, because, as you mentioned earlier, Alan, we are people of faith, and it's where he feels called to serve next. Uh, he's been a public servant for much of his legal career. Uh, as a district court judge for five years, going on five years now in Wake County, and as a prosecutor before that, of course, with the National Guard, there's that public service element as well. And going into this election, we talked and prayed about what was going to be best for our family and best for the state and best for him. And he decided this is this is where he wanted to serve. So. I'm doing everything I can to help him get there. And um, we're just so grateful for all of the people who have helped along the way, including um, Judge Dillon and Justice Newby. As you can see from the background in Justice Newby's screen, we really have a great team this election. I can't tell you how exciting it is to see such collaboration and, and just such a great group of people. I feel humbled to be able to speak among them sometimes, but I mean, it's eight judges that North Carolina should be excited to have in our appellate courts. Jefferson has practiced law on both sides of the aisle. He's been a prosecutor, but he started as a defense attorney. So he's got great perspective that uh, many jurists don't have. In addition, I, I'm fairly confident that other than Judge Gore, who is one of our Court of Appeals candidates, he's the only one with JAG experience, so the military law experience. Judge Dillon, please correct me if I'm wrong later, but there's just, there's, there are a lot of opportunities for Jefferson to make a difference on the Court of Appeals. And I'm just looking forward to seeing that happen and helping it happen as best I can. I think 2020 is a really exciting opportunity for conservatives and for as Justice Newby mentioned, judicial restraint. I hope people are paying attention to what's going on. And I'll say, and I'll hope that you've heard it before and not just from me, but judges do matter. As we saw with the voter ID issue, you know, the citizens of North Carolina voted for voter ID in a referendum and the legislature enacted a law and judges on the North Carolina Court of Appeals overruled that law. And so, that the judge who wrote the opinion was a Democrat judge who was elected in 2018. And it just, it is so important to vote for judges to finish your ballots and to encourage your friends to do so as well. So I'm gonna pass it over to Judge Dillon, uh, if, if I may, but I appreciate you allowing me to be here. Super, thank you. Chris? Good evening, my name is Chris Dillon. I'm sitting here in an office in downtown Raleigh and there's a, a crowd outside um, right now. So I hope the noise, you can't hear the noise too much, but uh, there's some people with uh, um, talking on, on a loudspeaker and everything. But um, I'm a judge in the North Carolina Court of Appeals and I'm from here in Raleigh, North Carolina. Grew up here, uh, went from a double Tar Hill and done a grad law school there. My father went to NC State, was a businessman here, and um, was a sports announcer there. My mother was a school teacher in Wake County. My wife and I married 25 years as of yesterday. She was the youngest of five children. Together, we have five children. We have um, five children around college age, and so they're all at home. So that's why I came downtown to do this. But um, uh, they're, we're doing okay right now. But uh, 
I ran for the Court of Appeals back in 2012. I, I have a, um, a background that's a, a little similar in some ways with uh, Justice Newby in that I, I, I had a, a real estate uh, practice and also have a real estate broker's license um, and, and worked at a community bank. And around 2012, I just, I just the economy wasn't really good and I, I thought it'd be a good, a good idea to run for the Court of Appeals. It's something I always wanted to do. And, I was encouraged to do so. I was. Uh, we we are 15 judges uh, elected statewide. There's five up this time. It's the most we've ever had up at one time. And I ran in 2012 because it, I was told that there just really wasn't anybody on our court that had any much experience in the business community. Uh, not that a judge needs to be pro business or any business, but just to understand business, so so we could understand the impact of the decisions that we would would make. And so I ran, and I was blessed to win in 2012. Uh, that year we ran as nonpartisans. There weren't R's or D's on the ballot, but this time um, voters will see R's and D's on the ballot. We have uh, five on our court, three on the Supreme Court, so we have more than we've ever had at any one time, um, eight appellate races. Uh, and I would say that uh, when I think of a conservative judge, it's not that, that we vote for the Republican cause or whatever. What a conservative judge is somebody that understands that their role is to stay in their lane, as Justice Newby uh, suggested and stated. Um, uh, we want judges who will uh, know what their role is. If, if, it's, if, the, if the General Assembly passes a liberal law, even if I don't like it, if it's within their power to, to pass it, we'll uphold it, because I think that's what a conservative judge would do. And, 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 um, and if, when a conservative legislature does the same, we, we would do the same thing. And, and we would certainly uphold any act of the governor if the governor, if it's within the governor's role to do that. Uh, this, this election is, is real important. We've had quite a bit of turnover on our court. Um, if I, I've, even though I've been here just one full eight year term, if reelected, I'll be the second most senior judge here um, of all the judges. Uh, so we have uh, a lot of, uh, we've got two people that are running that Governor Cooper appointed that, that um, and, and J Judge Griffin is running against one of the appointees and, um, and we'll have two vacant seats. And so I would just encourage people to, to finish the ballot, to understand who we are. And I would also say that I think uh, people in North Carolina, we have more and more unaffiliated voters. I've checked the voter registration since 2016. The Democrats are down 150,000 voters. The Republicans have maintained about the same number of voters, but unaffiliated voters are way up. And uh, Alan, there's more unaffiliated voters in Wake County than there are Democrats. I mean, there really are. There are a lot of them. So I think they're persuadable. And uh, the, the Republican judges do better typically than just the generic Republican candidate or the generic Democrat candidate. Uh, we do better than Republican candidates generically because I think there's some people, there's unaffiliated voters that want conservative judges, judges that aren't political, that won't uh, think about politics when they decide cases. And so as you tell your friends who are unaffiliated voters, you know, encourage them to finish the ballot and let them know that, you know, especially on the Supreme Court, we have a 6-1 majority of progressive judges. As you suggest, said, Justice Newby is the only conservative judge over there right now. And so I, I, there's a super majority over there, I guess you could say. And I think, I think unaffiliated voters would like to see more balance over there. And we have a majority of, of Democrat judges on our court right now. And I think that the unaffiliated voters would like to see more conservative judges. And I think if they understood that and knew that, that would be the message I would suggest that um, your listeners would tell their unaffiliated voter friends. So thank you so much for the, for having us. And, you know, we're excited to answer any questions that you, that you have for us or your, or your listeners have for us. Well, I appreciate that. And I, actually you guys have fed several there that I'm just going to kind of talk <laughs> off the cuff. And uh, we talked about this in, in agreement before we started. Uh, but your comment about the uh, the judges, just like the county commissioners, you're on the back of the ballot, but yet every day your actions impact the day-to-day -day Wake County, the North Carolinian, more so than, than I would when I go to Washington, D.C. Um, a lot of people don't realize, and it goes back to the saying, all politics is local. Well, you better find the judges that are going to uh, take the uh, laws that are passed by the General Assembly and, 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 and accept them versus trying to legislate from the bench. So uh, your comment about the UNAs, uh, yes, there's more Democrats than there are Republicans in, in Congressional District 2, Wake County, let's call it that. Uh, 
uh, but the UNA uh, uh, independent group is by far the, our largest group. And they are malleable. A lot of them already have right leanings or left leanings from center, whether they're uh, moderate liberals, moderate conservatives. Uh, we need to appeal to that group. Each of you needs to, as judges, just like the county commissioners, just like I do, to, to be able to pull a win off at the congressional district two level. But it's really important that we uh, get educated and, and promote you guys as, as, as a group. And I think this judicial victory, uh, when you look at uh, Paul Newby's uh, background there, uh, that's, that, that's one heck of a statement by all eight of you that you're running together as a team. And, and teams, if they pool together, you're going to be a lot stronger as a group just by virtue of all eight of you. So I, I applaud you for that because um, there's times in some elections where there's a 25% drop off uh, from the top of the ballot to the bottom. We don't want that. We don't need that. And 2020 proves every day with some of the incidents that are going on. Uh, Katie brought up a, a really good point, and, and I'll, I'll throw this out to all three of you. Uh, the voter ID, uh, the people are still asking, 54% of the North Carolina population in 2018 voted for voter ID. How can we, even after the General Assembly changed the law or, or an amendment, how, how can we be in the situation we're in right now? And why isn't the state government, why isn't the uh, state AG, I, he, uh, they happen to be a, a Democrat, why isn't something being done to overrule what's occurred? I'll throw it out to all three of you. Um, who would like to take tackle the voter ID question? Well, I, I think of the three of us, only Katie can really address it. Um, Chris and I can't talk about anything that is uh, either before the courts or could come before the courts. And uh, 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 Jefferson certainly couldn't as well, being, being a judge. Uh, Katie, being a uh, private individual, uh, can, uh, doesn't have the same constraints that we would have. But, but let me say this. Um, uh, like I said earlier, uh, I have uh, spoken to a lot of groups of foreign lawyers, and often it will be through translators. And I can remember one time I was talking with this group of lawyers uh, or foreign judges, and uh, I, I didn't feel like I'd explained very well what I needed to say. So I told the translator, uh, wow, I, I don't think I did very well. And he just laughed and he goes, what you say doesn't matter. What I say is what matters because he's the final say. You know, I, I can tell him precisely what it is. And if he wants to distort it, as he tells the other group, he can do that. Well, sadly, that's what judges do to the Constitution. Uh, we recently had a case where for 200 years, the word law, if I say the word law, uh, statute, um, what, who, who makes those? Well, for 200 years, the uh, idea is the word law meant what was passed by the General Assembly. But, um, majority of my court changed the meaning of the word law to be governor's policy preferences, putting that equal to what the legislators and the General Assembly do. My point is simple. There are seven justices on the Supreme Court or get to say what the Constitution really means. Now, you can argue, well, that doesn't seem right because I can read the word law in the Constitution and it clearly means what the General Assembly says, not the governor's policy preferences. And frankly, you can read my dissent and you would say, yeah, you're right. But four votes by the Supreme Court makes it what the Constitution means, whether it was meant that way or not. That's uh, frankly what those of us who believe in separation of powers, who believe uh, uh, in the framework that was originally established, uh, those are the challenges that we have. And that's true across the board on all kinds of issues. But uh, uh, Katie, it's up to you if you want to uh, address specifically, you kind of mentioned it in your opening statement. And, you know, it's up to you if you want to explain a little bit how that gets before judges and what judges do with it. Uh, you would think constitution, it's funny, I teach const state constitution law at Campbell. Uh, so, you know, I teach my students that the constitutions have particular meanings 
Uh, we've amended our constitution a whole bunch of times. That's the way it should be with state constitutions. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's what four justices or at the court of appeals, two out of three judges on a panel. Uh, you know, if it's a, if it's a group of three judges, a three judge panel, those would be trial judges, superior court judges. And again, two out of three, uh, what they say uh, can be the final verdict unless it's appealed. So uh, again, Katie, if you want to weigh in, feel free. I'll just add, Justice, maybe uh, we all know and we think about when we're voting for a president of the United States the impact that that will have on the United States Supreme Court. We know the president can appoint judges who serve for a lifetime. Now in North Carolina, we have a different system. We the people elect our state Supreme Court justices and we the people can bring into balance, again, um, if we elect the three conservative justices or judges behind Justice Newby who are running for Supreme Court, we will be closer to a, a balanced sub state Supreme Court. And as Justice Newby said, the state Supreme Court is the final say on matters of state law and the state constitution, which is what happened with the voter ID case. And I'll reiterate that I am speaking on my own behalf, not on behalf of Jefferson or anyone else, um, but it is just vitally important that we pay attention to these races because we can make a difference here and it would be a shame not to. Thank you, Katie. I, I guess I, I'd like to actually ask this. I'm, I'm sure the other two uh, judges are not going to be able to say something, but why just because we have a state AG who's a Democrat, it's his choice whether he wants to take this up or not. Is that correct? Or am I misinterpreting what could have happened? Shouldn't this be challenged based on what the General Assembly uh, changed that the Constitution was and the, the, the voting rights of the people? In other words, people voted 54% uh, mm -hmm. in favor of the change for voter ID. Why, why wouldn't the state AG uh, taking this up on behalf of the people of North Carolina? I can't guess, Alan, what the motivations are or are not um, for the Attorney General. And frankly, I don't know enough to know whether he, let me start over. This was a case that was brought to the court system by people who were unhappy with the 54% vote for voter ID. And so in the court system, that three, a, a three person panel of judges at the North Carolina Court of Appeals was the decider, the, the deciding factor. Now it could get appealed further. It may have been, I, I frankly don't know if it has yet or not. Um, but as for the AG's role, I'm sorry, I, I don't know. And my husband probably would, but he may not be able to talk about it. And I'm sure these two do but they can't talk about it. So I'll have to do some more homework on this because um, it sounds like folks are interested about it, which I'm, I'm so happy that you are. So I'll, I'll do some more homework and I'll get back to you, Alan. Okay, super, I appreciate that. <clears throat> um, I gotta be careful what I ask, I guess, because we have a couple of sitting uh, judges and Jefferson just happens to be on, on sabbatical with the guard, but um, some of the instances that have occurred, and I'm going to go to the Flynn case up in the Washington, D.C. Uh, circuit uh, court system with uh, Judge Sullivan, who appears to be uh, trying to legislate from the bench. I'm going to use my terms. I'm not a, I didn't go to law school. Uh, and then you look at uh, the incident that occurred, uh, it might have been earlier this week or late last week, and this is kind of directed to uh, Justice Newby. Um, I was shocked to see the current sitting Chief Justice come out uh, with a statement uh, and a position on with, with, with regards to the incidents that are occurring with, uh, with Black Lives Matter. Um, whether or not any of you can talk about it, but uh, the, the discussion by a lot of the lay people is that that just seems so out of touch, especially uh, based on each of you trying to recuse yourself from being able to answer some of these questions because how could she come out and make that kind of a statement as a, a sitting Chief Justice? Uh, how, Paul, can you answer anything on that or can you touch it? I'm not sure. 
Well, let, let me do it this way. Um, I have uh, uh, been in the legal system for 40 years. Uh, I've been on the court 16 years. Uh, we are not a broad-based policy uh, uh, creating court. What's important when people come before us is that we haven't staked ourselves out on any particular position on any particular issue. Um, if we do that, then we should recuse. Um, each judge and justice is uh, supposed to think about, well, if I make a public statement about something, is that going to make it appear that I have prejudged, I'm prejudiced about uh, an issue that could come before the court. Um, our court, uh, as I, I said, Lady Justice is blindfolded. She can't come see who comes before. Um, do we have a perfect system? No, uh, but I think we have the best system in the world. Uh, I think if anybody had to choose a tribunal uh, before which to try a case, whether it be civil or criminal, and they could choose any country in the world, I think they would choose America. Now, part of that, frankly, is because of our jury system. Only 10% of the world have a jury system. What does a jury system do? It strips power from one person, a judge, and gives it to 12 citizens, okay? So uh, it's, it's a, a beautiful system that dates back really to biblical times. Certainly uh, our modern jury system dates back to the Magna Carta. 1215, I was a small child, I remember it well. It's like, wow, we're gonna have juries now. This is pretty cool. Um, so when, when you think about the safeguards within the system, uh, and then let me mention also, um, do you really think a victim cares about the race of the perpetrator? Uh, my 20 years with the U.S. Attorney's Office, my 16 years as a, as a judge, I've never seen any indication anywhere that a victim has gone to law enforcement and said, hey, now, if the perpetrator is this race or that race, don't, I don't want you to prosecute. I mean, that's ludicrous. No, no one has ever done that. So am I saying that there has never been uh, an instance where uh, race played a role? Of course not. But am I saying uh, that the system is somehow infiltrated and uh, tainted uh, to a large degree. There, there, there's no racism or no, or anti, you know, the, a system can't do anything. They don't have, a system doesn't have a view. A system is made up of people. So who are you saying is involved in racism? Is it the prosecutor, the assistant DA, is it the jury? Is it every member of a 12 person jury? Is it the clerk? Is it the judge? Um, uh, uh, let's be precise. Uh, it's, it's easy to throw out generalities. And as the US Supreme Court said recently in a case, I think it's called McClary, they said, you, you can't disprove a negative. You can't go in and look at statistics and say, oh my goodness, uh, we've got this rampant problem based on these statistics. No. You know, uh, Alan, I'm sure in your career, you have found out, as I have, that you can uh, get statistics to say whatever you want to, because it really depends on what your criteria is and what information goes in. My point is this. Um, when I look at our system, when I look at our DAs, uh, assistant DAs, uh, public defenders, um, uh, uh, juries across the state, uh, uh, investigators, law enforcement. Uh, my view is that everyone conscientiously tries to seek truth, what really happened, and justice apply the law fairly and impartially to everybody. Um, so two parts to that. Uh, one is, as I said, we can't stake ourselves out on any particular issue that could come before the court. But the second part of that being, uh, let's look realistically at our system.
does that mean there aren't any actually innocent people in prison? There probably are. Uh, certainly we hear about that from time to time. Uh, but the vast, vast majority, 99.5%, 99.8%, uh, it's not about uh, uh, was the person guilty or not guilty. It's about uh, did they get a fair trial free from error that impacted the outcome? And as long as they did, uh, uh, you know, that's, that's what we're shooting for. So those would be my comments. Chris, did you want to add anything to his statement? Or? Uh, I, I would say, you know, we're, we're all human beings. So we have, I mean, as humans, we have biases. We have probably political opinions on things. But as a judge, I think what a conservative judge does is when they have a case, they try to figure out what is the law and they apply it. They, and, and I think judges have to be very careful not to say, well, I, this is where I think the law should be, or this is the result I want. Therefore, I'm going to apply this judicial canon of interpretation to reach the result I want. And, and, and so I think when, I'm not going to comment on what our Chief Justice said, but um, in, in, that you, that you re referred to, but I think we need to be careful about making statements regarding policies or political. If I want to change the policy, I can go run for the legislature. We need to be careful not to, not to voice what we might think in a political realm, because I think it just makes people have less, less confidence in the judicial, the judicial system anyway, in general. Um, people come before a judge where that judge has already expressed an opinion about something, might think that that judge is going to reach the result based on this is the result I think we should have, and I'm going to just apply the rule that gets me there, rather than taking an honest look at the law, honest look at the language that's before him or her in the statute or the Constitution, and just rule where the law leads that person, rather than leading the law, let the law lead them. And so I think we need to be very careful about what we say in public, because I think it makes people have a little bit, have less confidence that, that when they come before us, that they're really getting an honest, uh, that we're gonna look at it in an honest way. Thank you for that. Katie, I don't know if you wanted to say anything in addition to what the other two have stated. I don't think I could add anything, Alan, that, um, that they covered it. Super, thank you. Uh, this is a question that came in for Chris. Uh, both the others can chime in too, but uh, how have the courts changed during uh, COVID-19 crisis? Um, has the backlog uh, gotten uh, bigger, Chris, or have you been able to move through the system uh, as normal? Well, I come, I come into work every day, but uh, some, some people do not. They, have, they may have elderly parents they take care of, so they do work from home. Um, we're getting through our backlog just fine. We've continued to hold court, but we'll, we'll do it through WebEx. We've had arguments through WebEx as the Supreme Court has done. Um, so we have uh, maintained our, uh, you know, we've kept it going, but we've had to adjust to, you know, new normal, or, and hopefully it's a temporary new normal. On We email more than we uh, did before we're, uh, and, and things like that. So it takes a little bit of learning. Now, I will say that, uh, the trial court judges have slowed down, the trial courts have slowed down a whole lot. And so we usually get cases about six months, six to nine months when an appeal is taken. So we, uh, we, we suspect that the, the caseload will actually drop a little bit temporarily because there's just not as many cases going on right now. So there won't be as many appeals, but, but we've kept going. I, I know the trial courts have slowed down a lot, but we've, we, we've been able to keep going at our current pace. Um, which has been a good thing. We just had to figure out how to, how to do it more, more virtually. More virtually in technology. How about the Supreme Court, Justin Newby? Well, like, like Chris said, we are reaction courts. We, we can't go out and say, wow, that issue looks interesting. Let's find a lawsuit about it. Um, and what's happened is uh, the trial courts uh, throughout the state, um, because of uh, uh, some of the directives uh, have really slowed what's going on. There hasn't been a jury trial now for anywhere in the state for uh, going on five months. And um, uh, so justice delayed is justice denied. Um, I'm, I'm very concerned. Uh, I'm talking with uh, 
DAs, assistant DAs, or I'm reading about where they're dismissing cases because uh, there are no sessions of court. Uh, and talking with Judge Wood, who does a lot of uh, family law court, um, uh, you, you know, you've got these, these uh, issues with children and uh, all types of foster care situations that uh, have to be addressed. Um, uh, you know, uh, we've done virtual court uh, uh, just like we're doing virtual here. And uh, while this is great, uh, Alan, I'd much rather see you walking around in the neighborhood and uh, see you in person. So, uh, you know, um, a virtual is a band aid at this point. Uh, at some point, uh, you know, I, I, I'm a dinosaur. Uh, but I just think it's much easier. And again, we've just finished uh, 13 cases or 10 cases uh, uh, with arguments this week. And uh, where, uh, you know, do I think folks got a fair hearing? Yeah. Uh, did we have some glitches? Yeah. Uh, is it the same thing as uh, right there in the courtroom? Absolutely not. Uh, so I am concerned about the backlog. Uh, I'm concerned. Uh, the Court of Appeals and the Supreme Court are going to have cases that are, uh, or periods of time that are going to be uh, with a whole lot fewer cases simply because uh, they're not making their way through the trial system. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think, Alan, your, your question, were it, to address, were it addressed to trial court judges, I think you would get the real essence of the impact of the various um, um, uh, shutdowns uh, that have occurred and uh, the backlog that that's creating uh, at, the, at those levels. Yeah, I, it's probably where the rubber meets the road. It, it, it determines what your caseload is going to look like for the future. So I, I have to agree with you there. In fact, uh, trying to keep up with you and making out there walking the way you guys walk consistently, uh, I, I, I wish I had that stamina. So I do appreciate seeing you guys out there. It makes me feel much better knowing someone's getting some exercise. Uh, this question is- Well, we know you're pulling for us. <laughs> yeah, uh, this, 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 this question is for, is for Katie. Um, we've talked a lot about uh, conservative judges and justices, but here's your chance to plead, well, maybe for your future judgeship, but also for Jefferson's. And, and, and you're speaking on behalf of Chris and, and, and Justice Newby also, but why do we need conservative judges and justices, why? What, what, what's your belief in your heart and, and, and why for Jefferson? I believe in my heart, Alan, that all judges should be conservative. <laughs> if you define conservative the way Judge Dillon did, which is, and Justice Newby earlier, you know, you follow the law, you apply the law to the facts of the case in front of you, you treat both parties fairly, you treat both parties' advocates, their attorneys fairly, and I just, I can't imagine if, if I knew what, um, what a non-conservative judge was, or if I knew what was happening when people are taking laws that our legislature has passed, that not only has passed, but has debated, has called in experts to think and talk through these issues. And, and these are our elected officials. Our, our system was set up so that our legislators would be the ones enacting laws that affect North Carolinians and, and people in the United States. And so I think we have to vote for conservative judges because if, if they're conservative, then they are doing their best to faithfully apply the law. And I think it's as simple as that. Does anyone else Alan, want to can I give in? you a couple of examples? Uh, Katie, sure. thank you for that. But uh, so, so let's say, uh, Alan, you're an entrepreneur, uh, uh, small business success. Let's say that um, some young guys came to you and said, Alan, we want you to serve on our board. We've got this uh, uh, startup we're looking at, and uh, we know you've got some uh, influence with some other folks. How about just tell them about us? Tell us about, tell them about the opportunity to uh, invest some capital in our startup. And uh, you know the guys, and they seem nice enough, and they've got some pretty interesting ideas. Uh, so you tell a few friends, and your friends don't rely on what you said, but they go to the CEO, and they go to the CFO of the company, and they uh, talk to the sales manager, and 
they like the idea, so they invest. Uh, sadly, uh, things don't work out. Sometimes that's the way it is. Um, and these guys sue you uh, and say, well, uh, you're the one who told us about it. Uh, Alan, do you know that my court actually found that uh, an outside director who was, his information was not relied on by anybody. He simply uh, told some friends about the opportunity to invest, but they went directly to the officers and directors as they should, or the officers and the sales manager. Uh, uh, recently, uh, the, the, the person that would be just like you that I was using as my example, was held liable for a million dollars to these guys who had invested. Uh, the court overlooked or ignored uh, the statute in, uh, enacted by the General Assembly called, it, uh, called a director safe harbor statute, which basically says if a director relies on information uh, he or she receives from the company in good faith, they can't be liable. The court ignored that. The court ignored the fact that this guy never sold a security and found him liable for securities fraud. Securities fraud, he didn't, he didn't convey any securities. The company conveyed the securities based on these guys saying they wanted to invest. Um, that's the kind of liberal uh, uh, judicial activism that says, well, poor, poor investors, we're gonna overlook all the safeguards and let these investors uh, recover from uh, this outside director. Uh, to me, that's an example that uh, certainly uh, uh, undercuts uh, our free enterprise system. It discourages successful businessmen like yourself from helping out young guys as they're starting these companies. It dries up uh, uh, potential capital for these uh, small businesses. It's just wrong. Uh, it ignored the statute. So that's the kind of thing that I think Katie's talking about. It's interesting as I've talked to people across the state, liberal uh, lawyers, conservative lawyers, generally if you say, I want the law to be consistent and predictable and let the General Assembly make any changes, they almost universally agree on that. Because, you know, imagine, Alan, you go talk to your lawyer and you sit down with them and you say, well, what should I do here? And they go, well, it depends on how the Supreme Court thinks is fair or equitable or, and you say, well, what about this statute and that statute? And they laugh, oh, doesn't matter. It, it depends on their sense of fairness that day. You can't operate under that system. So um, uh, that to me is why people uh, know that we need judges who will not legislate but simply follow the law. Thank you for that. I don't know if you want to add anything, Chris, but I would tell you that uh, uh, when you see so much of this where several judges uh, appear to want to legislate from the bench, maybe they need to go back to their prosecution days and, 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 and give up their judgeship. But most of them don't want to do that. They want to, do, they want to have their, their cake and eat it too. Yeah, I, I, I would say that, you know, you always hear that, you know, they want, you know, judges say that I'll be fair, but, um, I always like to tell this story about my twin daughters and I'll tell it real quick. Um, I, I think we all have a different idea of what fair is. And so uh, I, I took them to go buy a dress for their middle school dance. And I told them they could each spend 20 bucks and they each grab one, grab the $20 dress and the other one grabbed the $25 dress. And the one that one that had the $20 dress said, dad, that's not fair. And, but what I told her was what, what wasn't fair was the fact that she got a dress that didn't pay for it. So, I mean, I think people have a different idea of what fair means. So I think what we need to do as judges is, you know, I think really what's fair is we apply the law as written. And, uh, and if you want to change the law, go to the General Assembly, and, you know, if, if that's what you want to do. I mean, that, I think people want justice because we, we all have a different idea what fair is. And I think that, as Justice Newby says, we just have people want certainty in the law. And so you, you want the law to be applied the same, whether it's a Republican suing or a Democrat suing. It doesn't matter. The law should be the same. And that truly is what's fair, I think. Um, but it makes, when judges say, oh, I, I'm fair, you, you, know, you gotta be a little careful, what, what does that mean? Because we all have different ideas about that. And, and Justice Navy, I don't know much about that case, but some judges think, well, the fair thing is just to redistribute this wealth and, and, 
and not apply the statute. And I don't know if that's really what, what is fair. I mean, you know, we, sh we, we need to guard against our own sense of fairness and just apply the law because the people think what's fair is what their members of the, what the people they elected in the General Assembly pass as a law. I, I appreciate that. In fact, Chris, I, I would tell you on the campaign trail, when you're talking about why conservative judges and justices, you should talk why fair and bring up the situation right there <laughs> about your daughters, because I'm telling you, it, you, you relate immediately to what you're trying to teach your children but also to the layperson, so they have a much better understanding of what fair means. Well, well, wait a minute, everyone has their own different definition of what fair is, but if you want someone just to interpret the law, that's probably the most critical piece of that whole thing. So those, those are all great comments, I appreciate this. Thank you. Um, this goes to Justice Newby. Um, why do we need a conservative chief justice? Uh, why are all of these down ballot judges so cr crucial too? Uh, why is your, I'll call it the gang of eight for judicial victory, let's call it that, but you have the floor, sir. Well, uh, thank you. Uh, I truly believe it has to do with uh, the uh, shaping of our judicial system uh, over the next eight years. And what I mean by that, is are we gonna have a system that fairly, impartially, consistently, and predictably applies the law, or are we gonna have super legislators who want uh, their policy views? Um, that's the difference between a conservative and a liberal judicial philosophy. I've actually heard uh, some of the folks that are uh, running this time uh, say that judicial philosophy doesn't matter. And my response to that is judicial philosophy is bedrock. Um, if you don't have a consistent judicial philosophy, uh, and in my case, you apply the law as written, as intended every time, uh, if you don't have that, then you're going to be uh, pushed here and there by the political uh, winds of the day. Uh, and uh, your uh, approach uh, will uh, be impacted by that. Your decisions will be impacted by that. So um, uh, policy making uh, is to be debated and done in the public square in the General Assembly. Uh, it's been that way in our state, under our state constitution since 1776. Uh, of course, federally, Alan, that's done in the U.S. Congress, uh, the House of Representatives and the Senate. Uh, those are the people's branches. Uh, unlike the federal constitution, the state constitution has given more powers to the General Assembly and fewer powers to the other two branches. Uh, and yet, I believe that we're seeing uh, as, as we look at the cases that are coming out, we're seeing uh, more uh, what I would call activism in cases like uh, one where I recently dissented, where uh, repeat child sex offenders have more rights than you and I do during COVID. Uh, repeat child sex offenders who were out of prison simply had to uh, be monitored so that they weren't going into schools, weren't going into parks and things like that. My court ruled uh, that that was unconstitutional. It violated their privacy rights. And yet think about it. Right now, uh, uh, if you come down with COVID, what's gonna happen? Oh, your privacy's gone uh, uh, because they're gonna do all this tracing. Uh, okay, well, they should. Well, frankly, we should be protecting our children from repeat sex offenders. Um, uh, those are the, the kinds of cases uh, that will be decided by the Supreme Court and the Court of Appeals. And the Court of Appeals is vital because such a, a, a small percentage of cases decided by the Court of Appeals actually make it to the Supreme Court. If there's a dissent, in other words, one of the judges of the three disagrees, it comes automatically to the Supreme Court. But other than that, uh, we grant very, it's called discretionary review or 
uh, discretionary writ, writ of certiorari, it's very rare that we actually grant review of those cases. So what Chris does, or what Jefferson wants to do on the Court of Appeals, those will be the law of the state uh, until the North Carolina Supreme Court weighs in and says otherwise. So uh, the, the three at the Supreme Court, as Katie has talked about, bringing some balance. Uh, the five at the Court of Appeals, there are only 15 judges at the Court of Appeals. One third of those judges are uh, up for election. Uh, so uh, it's, it's vital that people ask themselves, what do we want in a judge? Do we want judges to make policy or not? And if we don't, we need conservatives. Uh, and I'll say this as well. Uh, people have more influence in judicial races than any other race. Uh, Alan, folks are going to figure out uh, between you and your opponent, uh, they're going to uh, have some policy ideas and they're going to be able to say, okay, I want uh, Alan to be my congressman. But when it comes to judges, nobody knows who we are. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, for a, a while, uh, we didn't even run with partisan label and I had to go around saying, okay, guys, you got to remember my name newbie that doesn't mean i'm trying something for the first time okay yeah i know a newbie is a first timer but okay come on uh newbies have been in north carolina since 1700 we just never did anything how about scooby dooby vote for newbie i mean you know nobody knows who we are and if you are willing to call or email or use social media talk to friends and family about hey we need judges who understand precisely what their role is they practice judicial modesty. They don't go out and try to grab power from the executive or legislative branches. If that's your view, you can have a great impact on judicial races. I appreciate that because uh, educating the state of North Carolina, since you're running across the state, are, is critical and getting the word out. The fact that you guys have all come together, I call it the gang eight, you call it whatever you want, but I think what I would say is, is it's so critical that the, the names and the faces and understanding why we need conservative justice. So everything you guys are doing is phenomenal. And I think you got a great program. Um, I know we're running short on time, so I'm, I'm going to make this short. I, I, I'm going to give you guys 30 seconds to tell the UNAs that Chris has talked about and that we've discussed, why should they vote for you or your spouse in Katie's situation? And Katie, you get the floor first. Thanks, Alan. You should vote for Jefferson Griffin for the North Carolina Court of Appeals because he is a judge and a soldier who wants to serve you and he has the experience uh, to do it. Okay, super. Chris, the floor is yours. Why should a UNA, how do you pull them over to make sure they vote for Chris Dillon in November? Well, in this election, I'm, I'm the only judge running for re-election. We're having a lot of turnover in our court and I just think that uh, you know, I have experience. And also, I, ha I do have bipartisan support. I have former judges from both parties who are supporting me, um, which I think, uh, uh, I think, uh, I had one friend of mine who is a Democrat said, you know, you're unaggressively nonpartisan in that job. And I think that's what people want in, uh, in a judge. And I think that's what makes a conservative judge. So I would, I would uh, hope people would consider me for, for, for those reasons. Great. Justice Newby. Uh, conservative, common sense, constitutionalist. I think that's really what people want in judges, and I think that's the uh, eight of us. Uh, but uh, particularly for uh, Chris and Jefferson and me, uh, we just got good judgment. Well, how can I say that? Well, look at Katie. I mean, come on, really. I mean, you want to know the quality of Jefferson as a judge? Uh, look at that. And if you knew my wife, Macon, you'd say, wow. Uh, this guy married so far over his head. Katie's agreeing with that. Chris is agreeing with that. And uh, if you knew Ann Dillon, uh, you would agree that Chris also married way over his head. So the three of us have that in common. We have good judgment. Now, you might question our wives a little bit. Okay, we got that. But in terms of uh, us uh, 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 demonstrating uh, our judgment, uh, Exhibit A's would certainly be our wives. I think that's great. I think uh, the more and more of these you have until we can break out of this COVID times and, and, and you can start meeting people face to face, I think that's the best way to go. But I think going forward, uh, uh, as many of these as you probably are having, I've seen several of your others, uh, it's important that the entire group 
and I think three to four should be the max you ever use. That was what we've learned real fast that you, you can run out of time uh, and not get to know the candidate. So smaller groups and all this is important. So anything I can do, uh, Swain for Congress will, will, will assist in any, in, in any way, uh, form or fashion, and we can campaign together. Uh, but I want to thank all three of you. Uh, I think this has been a very enlightening. Um, we will have these available to everyone uh, on, on all, for your websites and, and along with Swain for Congress. Uh, but uh, good luck to all of you. Um, I'm hoping we can break out here soon and make a difference uh, and, and everyone be ready to hit the ground running for campaigning because uh, this has been some crazy months these last couple of months on how to, there's no book on how you, how you campaign in COVID times, but the fact that you guys have day jobs is amazing in itself. So I applaud you for that. Uh, this is my job. That's why everyone says, why are you smiling all the time? Because this is my job. Justice Newby has to go back and probably write some more dissents tonight after we're done here. But I really do appreciate everything you guys are doing and anything we can do to assist you. I appreciate it. So good luck to you. And thank you, uh, audience, for attending. And uh, look forward to the next one. Thank you. Thanks, Alan. Thanks, Alan.